Just shy of 300 pages, this book, No God But One, Allah or Jesus, is a logical approach to comparing Islam and Christianity from a former Muslim's perspective. It reads easy, though it does use end-of-book endnotes instead of in-chapter footnotes. This book argues for the credibility of Christianity over and against Islam by asking three questions. First, how are Christianity and Islam different? Second, is it possible to know if either Christianity or Islam is true? And last, is the truth worth dying for? While the third question wraps up the conclusion for the entire book quickly and succinctly, the first two questions spawn their own additional ones and make up the bulk of the book. For the first question, which explores the differences between Christianity and Islam, the late author Nabil Qureshi explores the differences between Islamic Sharia law and Christian gospel. Ultimately, the former is focused on laws for life, whereas the latter is focused on grace for diagnosing and then resolving the real problem, the heart. Then the author compares the Islamic Tawheed with the Christian Trinity. The question is fundamentally concerned at this point as to whether both religions worship and follow the same God. Ultimately, Allah and Yahweh are not the same, even despite the fact that modern Jews in Israel today may use Allah in reference to Yahweh as a generic Arabic term for God. The author shows that Islam's teaching that Allah is one is really incompatible with Christianity's teaching that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, in one being, and as a result is inherently relational and loving. Consequently, God's children are expected to relate with and love others, not merely out of compulsion, but also because it is inherent within them as imagers of God and because the Spirit empowers them to do so. Allah, on the other hand, forces the expectation on his followers either so that they can avoid going to hell, or another way to put it, earn going to heaven, which is essentially a selfish human motivation. As a natural extension of the Trinitarian contrast to the Tawheed, the author then seeks to compare prophets, Muhammad versus Jesus. Islam considers both to be prophets, but Muhammad was the last and final perfect prophet. Islam denies that Jesus was the son of God, though he was a good prophet and Allah did ascend Jesus to heaven. Christianity does not recognize Muhammad as a prophet, but it does uphold that Jesus was not only a prophet, but also the Son of God who died and rose again. Jesus is not merely an example to follow for Christians as Muhammad is for Muslims, but rather Jesus is the solution to humanity's heart problem. Afterwards, the author compares the Quran and the Bible. The Quran is believed to be the single eternal word of Allah, and to burn it is blasphemy for Muslims. The Bible is not in the same position within the Christian worldview, since Jesus himself is believed to be the word of God, though the Bible is revered as God's written word. As for the Quran, it was not delivered in linear fashion, and much of Islamic praxis is not included, which is instead explicated in supplementary hadith, documented examples from Muhammad's life. Furthermore, within the Quran, some portions could be abrogated. As a result, the Quran is not studied exegetically, but rather it is memorized and recited. In contrast, the Bible is explored exegetically, having been written in different styles and genres throughout different times and across different languages. When it comes to accuracy and reliability of the texts, Muslims fervently uphold that the Quran is flawless, but the Bible is flawed. In reality, the Bible has thousands of textual copies against a hundred or less of Quranic copies. Furthermore, the Quran is and was primarily recited from memory, and before it was written down, which was long after Muhammad's death, it was sustained orally. 
By the time it was written down, there were competing versions. No two were identical. One such version was taken to be the authorized version, and the rest were burned, forever lost. Lastly, the author compares jihad against the Crusades. For Islam, jihad is encouraged. For Christianity, meekness is encouraged. However, the Crusades did occur, but they were a defensive response. Ultimately, followers of Jesus are expected to be peacemakers, which is starkly contrastive to the calls to violence for apostasy in Muhammad's life example, or in chapter 9 of the Quran, these words were revealed in the last chapter and therefore were never abrogated in Islam. The last command of Allah was to harm Jews, Christians, and polytheists. In contrast, the last command of Jesus was the Great Commission to spread good news about God's love through his Son. After having compared and contrasted Islam and Christianity, the author fully explores the truth claims of each religion. He ruminates through five series of questions. First, did Jesus die on the cross? For Christians, Jesus died on the cross. For Muslims, Jesus did not die on the cross. The four Christian Gospels declare that Jesus did, in fact, die. The Quran, which came centuries later, says that Jesus appeared to die. The problem from an academic perspective is that even skeptics believe that Jesus died as an undisputable historical fact. Ancient non-Christian sources, including Josephus and Tacitus, bear witness to the death of Jesus by crucifixion. Crucifixion was itself terrible and shameful. The fact that Christians proclaimed it at all would have brought about derision, which points towards its authenticity as well. But the Quran upholds that Jesus did not die. And there are two prevailing Muslim interpretations in this regard. One, Simon of Cyrene took Jesus' place on the cross, but Allah made Simon to appear as though he looked like Jesus. So while Simon died, Jesus did not as Jesus was able to avoid the cross altogether. The other, Jesus was badly injured on the cross and made to appear as though he were dead so that once in his tomb, he could miraculously heal and escape. In the end, the author determines that Jesus did in fact die on the cross. Second, did Jesus rise from the dead? For Christians, Jesus rose from the dead. Muslims do not believe Jesus died so he did not rise from the dead, but Allah ascended Jesus to himself. Christians maintained from early on that the risen Jesus appeared to his disciples and even 500 followers at one time, and many of his disciples died for believing and proclaiming that they had seen him alive after his crucifixion. While Muslims are not generally opposed to the idea of the resurrection, they do maintain that Paul infiltrated the early church and corrupted it with nonsense about Jesus and about abandoning Torah. The author goes on to show that Paul submitted to Peter and the apostles, including James, Jesus' brother, so there is no evidence of such infiltration. In fact, the Quran never mentions Paul. In the end, the author determines that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. Third, did Jesus claim to be God? For Christians, Jesus is and was always God. For Muslims, Jesus was a good prophet, but he never claimed himself to be God. The Bible repeatedly declares Jesus to be God, and in the Gospels, Jesus does refer to himself as God, especially via his I am statements, which are a claim to the name Yahweh. It is not merely by name, but also by actions in which Jesus declared himself to be God because he did things that only God could do. But even before all of creation began, Jesus was God as declared throughout the Bible. Islam, however, maintained that Jesus never said, I am God, and therefore Jesus was not God. The author concludes that all the evidence shows that Jesus himself claimed to be God. Fourth, is Muhammad a prophet of God? For Muslims, Muhammad is the final perfect messenger of Allah. Many believe that he was peaceful and loving. They also believe that the Bible prophesied Muhammad would come. They also believe that Muhammad was granted specific and advanced scientific knowledge from Allah that he otherwise could never know in the 7th century AD, thus giving him additional credibility. 
However, from an outsider perspective, Muhammad's character was dubious at best and shameful at worst. When he first started receiving visitations from the angel Gabriel, he became suicidal. He was violent. He was abusive. Muhammad even took a nine-year-old wife and consummated the marriage with her when he was 52. As for the passages in the Bible that supposedly prophesy Muhammad, those passages are taken out of context and twisted in order to make it suggest anything related to Muhammad. When read in proper context, those passages say nothing about Muhammad. And when it comes to science, the supposed knowledge given from Allah were actually based on earlier Aristotle and Galen documents from centuries prior, or the facts presented have been scientifically proven to be false in the modern age. The reality is that it is not the Quran but the hadith that speak to Muhammad's character, and the hadith ultimately present shocking evidence about his actions and behaviors that stand to the contrary of the wholesome image traditionally passed down through generations of Muslims. In the end, the author concludes that Muhammad was not a prophet of God. Last, is the Quran the word of God? For Muslims, the Quran is the eternal word of God. For Christians, Jesus, not the Bible is the word of God. Muslims uphold the Quran as the reason for their religion. They believe the Quran is filled with validated prophecies. It bears a uniform literary excellence. It contains miraculous scientific knowledge. It bears exceptional mathematical miracles, and its text is perfectly preserved. However, the, the way the Quran was assembled was not in a linear fashion, and at oftentimes it has entire sections that are completely unintelligible. The so-called prophecies are far from it, could be abrogated, and in some cases were proven to be inaccurate. The so-called scientific knowledge are general in nature and offer no actual miraculous claims for science. The mathematical miracles are inconceivable when compared to fictitious books that have other similar marvels. But the most important issue is that the text of the Quran has not been perfectly preserved as mentioned earlier. The Hadith records how the Quran from early on had missing a verse or two, and even Muhammad himself said that some verses were forgotten easily. He himself even forgot a verse at one point and had to be reminded of it. But the biggest problem with this argument for the perfect preservation of the text of the Quran is that the authorized version omitted text that the best reciter of the Quran had included in his version that was later destroyed. And if that was not problematic enough, Muhammad also indicated that he could recite the Quran in up to seven different ways. In the end, the author concludes that the Quran is not the word of God. During the brief conclusion of the book, the author exclaims that Jesus died on the cross, Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus claimed to be God. But Muhammad was not a prophet from God, and the Quran is not the word of God. Therefore, the author concludes by asking whether the truth was dying for, and emphatically asserts that following Jesus is worth all the suffering in the world, even to the point of death. Now, I did enjoy this book. I did not enjoy it as much as I enjoyed his first book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. That book brought me to tears as it was quite moving with all of his memoirs about his religious path. This follow-up book is not personal, it is academic. In other words, it draws upon the mind and not so much on the heart. So with little critique I have, I will say that it is a good book and I would definitely recommend it to anyone interested in comparing and contrasting Islam and Christianity. However, I was not a fan of the argumentation when taken on the whole. For me, if the crux of the matter is the Quran as the word of God, I would like to start there. I think the author himself would agree. There's no reason to attack the revered person of Muhammad if the Quran cannot stand on its own. Attacking Muhammad will likely close doors, not open them. If wounds are inevitable, then it should be at the heart of the issue, the Quran as the eternal word of God. In my mind, that is what I think would be best. But I am not an apologist by any stretch of the imagination, and I know very little about evangelism towards Muslims. Now, you tell me in the comments below, what did you think about this book? Have you read it? What did you like? What did you dislike? What did you find compelling 
What did you not find compelling? Let me know. Check out the merch. Get yourself a hat. Or maybe a sweater? A t-shirt? There's lots of options. Go to the store, link in the description, pick up something for Christmas, enjoy, and thanks for the support. It's highly appreciated. Thanks for watching, or rather, thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.